on the 28th of May, 1912, Reverend Luke Donnellan, C.C., presented a lecture on traditional Irish and Highland airs at the Free Library in Dundalk, County Louth, Ireland. During the course of his talk, Donnellan explored the history of Ancoolin, an ancient air popular in Ireland. His lecture was subsequently published in the Journal of the County Louth Archaeological Society, number 1, volume 3, in December 1912. Using images and music, the following film recounts the contents of Luke Donnellan's lecture. This is Ancoolin. Before proceeding to examine the music of this famous song, it is fitting to turn our attention to what we know from books of the poem. James Hardyman gives a version of it in Irish Minstrelsy, Volume 1, page 250. In a note he tells us that the air of this song is by many esteemed the finest of the whole circle of Irish music. It is much older than the words which have been attributed to Morris O'Duggan, an Irish bard who lived near Ben Burb in the county of Tyrone about the year 1641. There are several sweet stanzas in Irish to this charming air, but the present are the best known and the most popular coolin means the maiden of the fair flowing locks. The original word is retained in the translation, being now, as it were, naturalised in English. Hardiman proceeds to quote Joseph Cooper Walker's credulous story that when Henry VIII ordered the mere Irish to be shorn, a song was written by one of their bards, in which an Irish virgin is made to give the preference to her coolin to all strangers, or those who adopted their habits. Of this song, he adds, the air alone has reached us, and is universally admired. A great deal of foolish speculation on Irish music and airs was indulged in by Walker, and this fabrication of his about the coolin has been repeated and discussed by various other writers, for example, Sir Thomas Moore. But Lawrence Renahan says that it was composed in consequence of a statute passed in Dublin in 1295 against those degenerate English who imitated the Irish in letting their hair grow in coolins. But the tune itself, as Mr. James Stewart, author of History of Armagh, very justly remarked, was probably of much greater antiquity. The act of Henry VIII did prohibit men from wearing glibs or crummels, that is, having the upper lip unshaved and the hair uncut over the ears after the present military fashion, and women from wearing any kirtle or coat tucked up or embroidered or garnished with silk after the Irish fashion. And for this reason, that there is nothing which doth more sentain, and keep many of the subjects in Ireland in a certain savage and wild kind and manner of living. But it does not even mention the name of Cullen, which as a mode, had perhaps before that time fallen into disuse. This oversight of Thomas Moore is the more remarkable, as the Act of 24, Edward I, 1295, the only act against Coolins or Coolines, had been previously noticed by Edward Lettich and by several others after him. This unedited statute is found in the Harris Manuscripts in the Library of the Dublin Society and in some cathedral registers. The following is an extract. Anglici etium quasi degeneris modernus temporibus hibernicalibus si indulgent vestimentis. Some degenerate English lately dress in the Irish fashion and dress and bind their hair from behind and call the mode a coolin. 
They dress and make their toilet as the Irish, so that it often happens that some English people are killed being taken for Irish. Although the slaying of an Englishman demands a different scale of punishment than the killing of an Irishman. All English people in this country should at least dress their hair and cut it like the English and should not presume to wear a coolan. And should they do so, the judiciary and the seneschals shall, by depriving them of their lands and chattels, and even by arrest and imprisonment, compel them to relinquish at least the Irish mode of head toilet. The officers of the Crown, it appears, actually made reports to the government of those who cut off their coolants. But the Bard viewed their conduct in an opposite light, and made the Irish maiden despise the conformist and prefer the chieftain lover with the coolan. Again, continuing this foolish speculation, Thomas Lawler Cook, author of The History of Burr, in a communication published in Michael Conran's National Music of Ireland, discusses W. L. Lynch's essay in the Dublin Penny Journal on the error of Thomas Moore, for the latter pointed out Moore's error before Renahan, and finds the statute that Moore relied on printed as chapter 15 Henry VIII instead of chapter 28. Just as Renahan shows this statute had no reference to the Coolin, Cook points out that the statute of Edward I was only a prohibition to the English wearing the Coolin, but that would not have caused the Irish ladies to lament in their native language and melody the loss of the Coolin which they so prized as ornamenting the heads of their Irish husbands and lovers. Dr. William Henry Grattan Flood, on page 108 of his History of Irish Music, S. J. A. Fitzgerald and Redfern Mason, quotes the testimony of W. L. Lynch and Lawrence Renahan, but have overlooked the force of Cook's argument with reference to the statute of Edward I. And while Dr. Flood states that this statute was unknown to Alfred Moffat, the latter in a note of a communication sent him by C. F. Cronin of Limerick puts the case more correctly. The origin, authorship and original name of this world-famed melody are unknown. Neither the Act of 24 Edward I AD 1295, quoted by Lynch in the Dublin Penny Journal, nor that of 28 Henry VIII on the fanciful authority of William Beaufort had any connection whatever with its origin. The Coolin mentioned in W. L. Lynch's memoir is certainly not its original name, nor is there the slightest foundation in fact for that writer's beautiful story of the bard, the virgin and her lover, a story manifestly borrowed from Walker and fabricated by his friend Beaufort. Not less unwarranted and misleading is the latter's audacious interpolation of the word coolins, after that of glibs. It is not mentioned nor even implied in the act of Henry VIII, which was directed against the wearing of glibs only, then and for long afterwards, the popular hair fashion among the natives. This tune, according to Eugene O'Curry, was called the coolin about a hundred years ago for the first time, and then only in reference to Irish words. See Dr. Douglas Hyde's Love Songs of Connacht, 1893, pages 70 to 71, written to it by Father Oliver O'Hanley, a Gaelic poet of that period, circa 1700 to 1750, in praise of a beauty in the county of Limerick of the name of Nelly O'Grady. It cannot be said that O'Curry is correct in this, and the probability is that Morris O'Duggan of Ben Burb did compose a poem with this air, perhaps substantially the same as the different versions given by James Hardyman, Volume 1, page 251, O'Daly, page 155, and Dr. Hyde, pages 70-73, to in the Love Songs of Connacht. It is a great matter, at any rate, that so many versions of the poem have been preserved, but it did not fare so well with the air versions. Alfred Moffat gives a list in support of his contention against 
Charles Villiers Stanford that, as the latter alleged, Thomas Moore did not mercilessly alter and spoil the air. Moore printed his song, Though the Last Glimpse of Erin, to the air in 1807, in the first number of his Melodies. It was this song from which Lord Byron borrowed a thought from his Corsair, and he said to Moore afterwards, It was shabby of me, Tom, not to acknowledge that theft. The Cullen appeared in a number of works prior to Moore's 1807 publication. A reference to any of them will show the reader that Moore's version is not only correct and unaltered, but that in substituting Edward Bunting's air, which, by the way, was not published until 1840, and in charging him with spoiling the air, Sir Charles Stanford is unjust to the memory of the poet. The air appeared in Walker's Irish Bards, 1786, air number 10, Urbani's Scott Songs, volume 2, 1794, Aird's Collection, volume 5, 1797, Adam's Musical Repository, 1799, McGowan's Repository, circa 1803, Mulholland's Irish Tunes, 1804, Sidney Owenson's Hibernian Melodies, 1805, Holden's Collection, Volume 1, 1806, etc. An examination of these works will show that although slight variations of the grace notes occur, the air itself practically remains the same. William Shield also made use of the Coolin in the opera The Mountains of Wicklow in 1798. Dr George Petrie noted down a melody which he called the Old Cullen, but, according to Alfred Moffat, it has nothing in common with Bunting's hybrid tune. Redfern Mason, in his Song Lore of Ireland, takes a different view of these versions. He says, Several well-contrasted variants of the air have come down to us. Here is the melody in its most familiar form, which is also the form accepted by the authorities as the most perfect. For this melody it was that Moore wrote, though the last glimpse of Erin. It is one of the fairest jewels in Ireland's crown of song. The contour has the unaffected elegance of the lily, and Chopin himself never infused greater variety of rhythmic charm into a composition of like proportion. How has this perfection been arrived at? Is the Coolin the little masterpiece of some individual musician whose name has not come down to us, or does it represent the refining labour of many generations of singers? Assuredly, the latter alternative is the correct one. For if the song had come into being perfect, like Pallas from the brow of Zeus, we should never find any such ingenious version of the strain as Teague MacMahon learned in County Clare and gave to George Petrie. The tendril-like elegancies of the familiar tune are absent. There is a wide divergence, too, in melodic outline, yet the identity of the two airs admits of no doubt. Reason and intellect alike persuade us that this is near kin to the air which gradually developed into the coolin we all love today. Fortunately, for our right understanding of this interesting problem in a melodic evolution, Edward Bunting has preserved us an instrumental version of the Coolin, which goes back to the close of the 17th century. Edward Bunting, it will be remarked, was commissioned to write down the tunes played by the Harpers at their famous meeting at Belfast in 1791. 
The most notable figure in that gathering was Dennis Hempson, a musician of patriarchal age, in whose playing Bunting believed he could discern the remains of a noble artistic tradition. Hempson played for his young friend, the Cullen, as he had learned it in 1700 when a scholar of Cornelius Lyons, one of the last of the heroic race of harpers. This version is here reproduced. It shows the harper's disposition to regard the tune he was playing as a sort of a given theme, and so fretwork it with ornamentation of his own devising. It is easy to see how a player with a touch of genius, perceiving the golden possibilities of a simple strain, might convert it into a great melody. The primitive melody was, in all likelihood, the outcome of deep feeling in some person of musical genius, who may or may not have been a musician, for the gift of melody like that of poetry is the prerogative of no class but a gift from a mighty God. The Clare tune probably comes nearest to the original strain. Perhaps some harper enriched it with the vine-like embellishments which we all love, and it may be that the bars of contrasting rhythm, which form so dainty an episode in the master version, were added by a piper with a head full of jigs and reels. But this, of course, is pure conjecture and aims not so much to lay down the law concerning the growth of this particular melody as to indicate the influence commonly operative in the development of Irish music. The version which I succeeded in finding shows that the master version, as used by Thomas Moore, is tolerably correct, and that Moore did justice to the rhythm and metre of the air, and it at the same time shows that the hand of the instrumentalist is responsible for the sharpened fourths. In my version, the fourths are altogether absent. The tonics of two of the phrases end on the hard accent, that is, at the beginning of the bar. In the traditional version, all end on the soft accent. The development of the theme in the third phrase is artificial, and clearly the work of an instrumentalist, and very poor as compared to the traditional version. And lastly, their rhythm and accent do not altogether correspond. The words I heard sung to it would, in the main, correspond to Dr. Douglas Hyde's fourth version of the song. I got this version from John Williams. I also procured another version from Mrs. Gorham, which I give. The words which he used would correspond to John O'Daly's version. We can see that her air is not by any means so artistic or resembling the well-known version as that of Williams. I would not say that it is a more primitive form, so much as a deterioration. Still, it is an interesting and beautiful version, and well worth saving. I think it was this air, or a version of it, that has been accommodated to the ballad Bold Robert Emmett. In the National Songs of the Southern Slavs, a collection by Franho Kuhak, there are four versions of a song called Kara Mustafa, the air of which practically corresponds with this version of the air of the Kulin. Redfern Mason strongly states, in the quotation I have given, that Petrie's air was the one from which the Kulin was developed and that it came nearest to the germinal air. And, of course, it is evident that Bunting's version was composed after the whims and vagaries of the instrumentalist, just as Redfern Mason correctly conjectures the episode of the master version was. It cannot with truth be said, as he states on page 79, that this episode fulfils its office perfectly. The change from the long-drawn-out elegiac notes to a rhythm of alternate long and short notes, suggestive of the dance, is striking and beautiful. Even this brief subordinate theme closes with a glance at the principal theme. The traditional air shows that this episode has been very imperfectly written, so much so that it 
practically amounts to a repetition and does not do justice at all to the air, just as the writer of a sonata would utterly spoil his work if he did not artistically construct his subordinate theme in harmony with the principal one, so as to have unity and perfect contrast in the composition. We have here, then, another proof of the value of the traditional air as a corrective on already received versions. And if we are to build up a school of national composition, we must have true tradition to work on and copy from. Already we have had composers of various nations founding new modern schools of composition in this way. The newest opera of Rogero Leon Cavallo, which was produced at the Hippodrome in London, is called I Zingari. He calls his new work the Sister of Pagliacci. Before writing the piece, the maestro had studied 500 compositions of the Romanian gypsies, who have a special scale of their own. Signor Leon Cavallo says he has taken no portion of an air or air itself from the gypsy music, but he has embodied its spirit and the local peculiarities which distinguish it in his work. In this opera he has introduced a new instrument which is called a contro violin. It is played by a cellist and is an octave under the violin. He had it made to give effect of the peculiar tearing sound of the Zigan music. The effect of this instrument in harmonies is described by Signor Leon Cavallo as extraordinary. Only a few days ago, Dr Hugo Felix, the Viennese composer who is now in America, has expressed to a Chicago interviewer his great desire to hear an opera produced in Gaelic. I think, he said, it is one of the most interesting of languages. Such an opera, he thinks, would not only be a great success, but would arouse great interest in Irish music and might result in an opera which would embody the folk songs of the Emerald Isle. Of Irish music, he said, I doubt if there is any more melodious music in the world, and the heart motif makes it appeal universal. Every person who loves music responds instantly to the well-known Irish songs, with their intermingling of sorrow, love and joy. But the great wealth of Irish melodies is almost unknown. Someone is going to hunt them out, and then we shall have an opera of real sentiment, sincerity and melody. Luke Donnellan, 1912 Mom. 